everybody. Um, I'd like to again thank uh, Steve Kim and the Ever Young Canada uh, for allowing me to do this today and be able to talk to you. Um, my name is Fred Prock. I'm a psychotherapist, massage therapist. I've taught meditation for 50 some years and um, I'd like to share a little bit with you. I'm sure by now everybody has heard about something called mindfulness and that is to be present in the moment. And we have, we have a, well I'd like to tell you a story, um, but before I tell you the story I'd like to set it up a little bit. So um, when we have anger, the body's response to anger is to generate a lot of energy for fight or flight. If we have fear, then what happens is we get that energy so you can get away or, or deal with whatever the situation is. But the awareness is closed down with fear to the form of the threat. And that is a survival technique. So if you're walking through the jungle and there's a huge uh, boa constrictor hanging down from a tree, you focus on it. If you know about boa constrictors in the jungle. And so you avoid being dinner. Um, that, in our culture, in the city, there aren't many boa constrictors. And so, a lot of the, the uh, fear, a lot of the threats are abstract. It still closes down the awareness, the focus of awareness. And we have less access to our ability to respond to the resources that we would respond with in the situation. And anxiety is interesting because it's a situation where either we don't know what the threat is or we don't know how to respond to it. We don't have the resources to respond to it. We can't access them. And so we're in a dilemma. And all that does is cause huge stress in the body. And when we have that, the body tightens and, and starts to interfere with all the different functions. And it's the fascia that does that. We talked about that before. So, in, in understanding this, um, what I was going to do is tell you a story. And I had a friend who, this is a few years ago, and she'd been on a tour uh, going around the world. And she'd been away. I hadn't heard from her for a couple of years. And one day she called, and she was very upset because... Um, she'd found a lump and she went to the doctor and the doctor said that he thought that she might have breast cancer and she went to the oncologist and the fellow said that they could just excise the lump and she'd be fine because they got it early enough. But they also did biopsy for a couple of lymph nodes and unfortunately they found some cancer cells in the lymph nodes. And she was then uh, put on chemo, but first she had to do radiation. And um, she was given pills, a pill, once a week, just one little pill. And she would go into a room with about 20 other women that were having the same treatment. And there was a small room and all the chairs were backed up to the wall. And the nurse had come in with the pills and, and some water and, and go to each one and everybody would take the pill and whatnot. And my friend Jane had the problem that she'd take the pill and then that day and for four days she'd be throwing up. And if she didn't have anything in her stomach, she'd be dry heaving and just really uncomfortable. And then she'd be totally nauseous for the next three days till she got the pill again. And this had been going on for a few weeks. And she said, do I know anything? that would help. And I said, well, I could suggest something, but your doctor probably won't like it. And she said, anything, anything, just tell me. And so I suggested that she ask if she could just hold the pill for five minutes before she took it. And in that five minutes, just love the pill. And so she said she'd try, and the doctor thought it was a great idea. And so he had her sit behind the door that the nurse came in, and 
she got the pill before anybody else and then the nurse would go all the way around the room the other way and back to her. So she was actually holding the pill for more than 20, you know, 10 minutes before the nurse got to her again. And that was a Thursday, she got the pill on Friday and Monday she called me and said there'd been no nausea, no throwing up, nothing. She just felt normal. And, and the point of the story is that what we think determines how the body responds. The body thinks that what's going on in our mind is reality. And she thought the pill was poison, right? And so did the body, because she did. And the body was trying to get rid of the poison by throwing up. Um, we have the placebo effect, where you take a, a pill that doesn't do anything, but if you believe that it does, then your body responds as though it, it is actually effective. The nocebo effect is the opposite, where you think something's really bad and the body reacts as though that's the situation, which is what was happening for her. And by loving the pill, changed her whole attitude towards the pill and the body responded to that and it was fine. So if we understand that, then we can have some choices in our lives that we don't normally have. If we understand that the body can't tell the difference between what we think and what is actually a sensory experience in the present moment, then we can make our choices. And actually they've done research on that, um, where they've had people with MRI, the, the functional MRI helmet on, and they'll show the person an object like a, a, a coffee mug, and they'll have them look at the, the coffee mug for a minute, and then have them close their eyes and they'll be videoing the, the MRI changes and, and then they'll have them close their eyes and remember what the mug looked like. And the result of that is that the same areas on the MRI, the same areas of the brain, light up the MRI. So physically, in the nervous system, in the brain, there isn't much difference between remembering it and actually having the sensory experience of it initially. Whatever we think is, has a tremendous impact on the body. The body intelligence also can't tell the difference between past, present, and future. Everything is right now. And we think that the past is real, but it's not. It's a, it's a, a construct in our nervous system that we bring back to the present. And we can only think about yesterday right now. We can only do anything right now. We, you know, if we're, we're imagining that we're going to go shopping and buy all the ingredients for our dinner, we have to think about that now. Right? We're not experiencing the future. We're not experiencing the past when we think about yesterday or 20 years ago. If we understand these very simple things, then it gives us a way of interacting with our bodies to help them um, deal with whatever it is that we're dealing with. So if, if we're ill um, and we think it's terrible, then the body says, oh my God, it's terrible. Right? If we change that and are positive, then we have the placebo thing happening without us not understanding it. Uh, we, we, we have the placebo effect because we're creating it intentionally. And so the intention is really, really important. And if we imagine loving something, then the body, as Jane's experience, feels that it's great and, and accepts it. So we can change a whole lot of things by doing that. Um, the things that might make us anxious, the things that might make us afraid or angry or frustrated, they're all triggering a body response. If we change our attitude towards them, if we're loving towards them, and, and I mean, we can be just happy, but love seems to be the, the main thing that the body responds to the most, um, then the body's internal functions 
will improve, especially the immune system. And in these times of COVID, um, anxiety is huge because we don't know, we can't see the, the virus, right? We only know what we hear on, on TV and what people talk about. And so the anxiety level in the society is enormous. And a lot of psychotherapists are just dealing with COVID anxiety. Um, if we understand that we can change that, we, we can love the abstract virus. We can love the fear, how, how the fear is in our bodies. Where we tighten up, if we feel uh, afraid and we start to tighten up in our stomach, then we can just imagine that area and, and love it. And if you, if you have um, someone in your life that you love or had, or a pet, then just imagine whoever it is and feel the love and then redirect that feeling to the area or the thing that needs to change for you and for your body. So it's, it's a very simple technique. Um, basically, we look at the situation and notice where our bodies are tight. We notice what it is that's the issue and we love it and see what happens to the body. That experience can change a lot of things um, really simply and easily. And it's just our attitude. If we're really afraid of something, um, then the body is going to react as though it's a tremendous threat and will tighten up. And that will interfere with the immune system, that will interfere with all the different functions in the body. Um, the membrane structure, the fascia in the body, is the major uh, participant in the protective response. And it tightens up. It contracts, it creates fiber patterns that actually um, are protective, make the fascia stronger. So, you know, if, if we're going to get attacked by a, a tiger, then we want to be able to protect ourselves somehow. And, and that's as good as it gets for the body. Hopefully we won't ever be attacked by a tiger. But the idea is that, that if you have an injury, your body will tighten up to protect that place that's injured. And there'll be fiber patterns spreading out from that place that act like, well, they're like tree roots that are trying to stabilize the vulnerable place. And that's great. And the, you'll feel often, like if you've sprained an ankle or something, it will feel really tight and stiff for a while. And, and that's splinting it splinting the, the, the ligaments and everything so that the healing can take place. So it's, it's functional. But if you keep thinking about being afraid or being anxious, if whatever it is that's, that's triggering that, then that, that will start to interfere with normal function, that tension in the fascia. And so we need to be able to help the body let go of it. And you can do that by love. A um, long time ago, a long, long time ago, I had, I had a recurring dream that happened just occasionally over about six years. And um, in the dream, I was the ocean, and I was jealous of somebody walking along the beach with a bucket of water. They had the bucket of water, and I was jealous of that. Um, it took me six years before I realized that the ocean, which is me, was love. And I was jealous of that little bit of water over there that that person had and I didn't. And the reality is that what we truly are, the only thing that, that has maintained through our whole lives to this moment, is awareness, consciousness. That's the only thing that hasn't changed. That's the continuity in our lives. That's what we are. 
<clears throat> and so with that understanding, love is probably the deepest level of reality in consciousness. And if you, if you think about it, I mean, to experience anything, you have to be conscious. If you're unconscious, there's nothing to experience. There's nothing you can be conscious of, or experience rather, outside of consciousness. Um, I don't know whether you've had your, ever had your leg go to sleep, but if you try to walk on it, <laughs> it's difficult. You're not getting the feedback from the nerves in the leg, and, and you're not contracting muscles in a coordinated way because the nervous system isn't functioning properly. And the nervous system is enlivening consciousness. Uh, as far as I know, there's no consensus of how that actually works, but that seems to be the case. And anesthetics interfere with that, and, and certain drugs interfere with that. And, of course, if you put pressure on nerves, that interferes with it too. But the idea is that that consciousness is the essence of what we are. And love is the deepest level of that. So, most people want love. They want to have love in their lives. It's really important to them. Um, and it's, it feels terrible if we are in love with someone and, and then it's gone. Um, but what we're looking for is what we truly are. That's why it's so important to us. And so this technique of loving the things that, that we're afraid of or that make us angry, things that trigger us in a negative way, can really help not only resolve the body's response, but also awaken that sense of what you really are inside. So that's all I have to say this time. Thank you.